Good morning, New Hope. Isn't it a beautiful Palm Sunday morning? Lord, we just declare that we love you this morning. Father, we just thank you for your, we're just so thankful for your presence among us today. We rejoice, God, in your presence. We just invite you to have your way among us this morning bring life from every area of our hearts that seems dead today. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord, that we just get to enjoy you today and enjoy each other. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's go ahead and stand. front of a little kid today, you're going to get this all during the service, right? Well, a few announcements for you today. First, I want to say happy birthday to Jeanette Van Vlack. Woo! She's 30. It's a 
big birthday for her. And Paul Andreessen is going to be 71 tomorrow. <laughs> Woo! Still a cool bass player, man. I'm still a groupie. Okay. Also, Easter's coming. Good Friday's coming. I have a sign-up sheet. If you want to have an Easter lily purchase that you can take home, you can sign up. And if you want to come to Easter breakfast, sign up. If you don't sign up and you still want to come, that's just like totally okay. It just lets us know whether we should plan for 3000 even though it won't matter because God will make the food last. But we still want to try because we're humans to plan for that. So I'll pass that around. And then when it gets to the back, if you can, Sydney, can you make it jump the aisle? Okay. And then um, if you were not here last week or you were here and you want to sponsor a compassion child, there are still packets on the table. And I will try to be out there afterwards to help you with that if you want to pick a child and explain a little bit more about that if you weren't here. And then also want to say thank you to Paula and Dave for these palms today. That's really wonderful. That's great. I really thought they were going to prune this one back here, and I was really glad to see it wasn't bald when we came in today. <laughs> they got fresh ones. Um, also to let you know, if you're an elder, we're having an elder meeting Monday at 6.30. And this Wednesday for a while, we're watching the movie The Star of Bethlehem, which is a super cool documentary that tells about the star and about the crucifixion and how the stars all do that. It's, it's just amazing. I have seen that. Good Friday service is Friday here at 6. Then Easter, two services, one at 7. I'm not going to... You did it. I'm looking at pastor. So those online are going, who is she talking to, her husband? No. The other. And then, then there's the breakfast at 8.30 and then 10 o'clock service. I'll be awake for that one. Okay. All right. Have a blessed day. Good morning. This is a call to worship. Rejoice, O people of Zion. Shout in triumph, O people of Jerusalem. Look, your king is coming to you. He is righteous and victorious, victorious. Yes, as he is, is humble, humble, riding on a donkey. On a donkey. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day that you've given us. We thank you for all that you've done for us and all that you do for us. Father, we pray that you will keep us in your care moving forward into your light and will. Fill us with your spirit this morning, Lord. Fill your house with your spirit. Help us to be the people you want us to be. Help us to hear your voice and be obedient to you. And most of all, Lord, help us to please you. Keep us walking forward into your light and will and bless us this day in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to remain standing and we're going to to share the Apostles' Creed with each other. We haven't done this in a long time. It's in your bulletin. This is what we believe as Christians. And so let's proclaim it not mildly but boldly, okay? In your bulletin, the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he arose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sat at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. I just wanted to add, um, as we go back into worship, we're entering into what we call Holy Week in the church. And this is a time where we just prepare our hearts um, to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the single most important um, day of the Christian calendar. 
And because without a resurrection, uh, we would have no life, right? Without a resurrection, there's not a hope and a future for us. But um, just to prepare our hearts, I know we have all these special services going on, but the Lord put it on my heart also um, to consecrate this week as a week of prayer and worship and seeking the Lord in a, an intentional way. And so I'm going to be over here at the church every morning, Monday through Friday, from 8 o'clock to 9 o'clock in the morning um, for prayer. And there will be some just some quiet music, worship music happening. So if you want to just begin your day, um, of every day of Holy Week, um, with that moment of consecration, you guys are welcome to join me. If nobody comes, that's fine. I'll, I'll be here by myself with the Lord. But 8 o'clock, Monday through Friday. a fresh reminder of what that cross means to us today, what it means that our sins are forgiven, what it means that your mercies are new for us every morning, that we don't have to carry the burden of guilt or shame anymore, that we can just lay those guilt and the shame on you every day, and thank you, God, that you died to take it. that sets us free from bondage. Thank you for the cross that brings us healing. Light of the world, you step down into darkness. Open my eyes, let me see.
for the cross this morning and pray God that um, in this moment as we hear your word today that you give us a greater understanding and an appreciation for the cross Lord that we wouldn't live callous that we wouldn't live indifferent but every day we would understand the greatness of your gift to us in Jesus name we pray amen you may be seated I want to mention to you that, uh, oh, and our children, oh, our children, yes, come on, yay, <laughs> yay, thank you, Miss Judith, and all of your helpers, all the guys and gals that you have with you. Amen. All right. Well, as I was saying before, uh, uh, before I forgot to, to, to uh, share the moment with the children, last week was an incredible week. Last Sunday was an incredible Sunday. How many of you were here for that? Any of you here? Okay. It was an amazing day of, of talking about Compassion International and how God is working through that. And I want to share with you that through your efforts, 14 children were sponsored. Is that right? 14. And that might not seem like a big deal, but it is. There are 14 children in this world that are now going to have a chance at life and education and medical care. And you made the difference. And so we just want to say thank you. And over $1,000 was received to support the Kenyan, was it the water crisis? The food crisis in Kenya. That will buy a lot of food. $1,000 doesn't go very far, even at Walmart or Aldi's, but it sure does go a long way in Kenya. And so thank you for sharing that. Now, I do want to mention, you might say, well, I would still like to sponsor a child. Well, there's children still. Uh, their little packets are on the table just outside the door, and you can sponsor a child if you would like to, or maybe you'd just like to give to the Kenyan uh, uh, food issue the food crisis that they're having and if you want to do that you can just make your check out uh, in the memo just put Kenya will that work and so and we can do that with all if you would like to give to the New Hope Fund or if you'd like to share whatever your offering needs to go to we're okay with that and 
or if you want it just to go into the general fund that pays the bills, then that would be fine too. And so let's continue this moment of worship, always realizing that our gifts, our tithes, and our offering is a worship moment to the Lord. So as our ushers come forward, we will receive his tithes and our offerings. And, oh, God, we thank you for the privilege of giving. We remember how much you've given to us, how you've blessed us. And we just want to say thank you. We want to give our tithes and our offerings that, it, that these will be a blessing to others, that will share your good news and your grace and your mercy and your salvation with those that maybe have never even heard your name. Thank you for what a privilege it is to share. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Let me add that the words that Diane shared with this is going to be a wonderful week in the life of our church and we just invite you to get involved with all that is going on um, this coming Wednesday night you say well you're showing a video this is a video that has changed my life that's how important it is it's called the star of Bethlehem you think well what what does that have to do with Easter it's everything to do with Easter and you'll see what I'm talking about when, when you see it. You will want to show your friends and neighbors. That's how amazing this video is. And we will be showing that during the Bible study hour, which is at 7. It'll be starting roughly about 7 o'clock, 7.05, something like that. And so we invite you to be a part of that. Then on Friday, we have a good Friday service. I'm not going to tell you anything about it, except you've never seen anything like it before. And so I just want to invite you, if you don't come, here's the deal. If you don't come, you'll regret it. That's a promise. If you don't come, you will regret it. So I invite you to be here Friday, 6 p.m. for our Good Friday service. And, of course, uh, Diane shared with you about all that's going on on Sunday. I thought you planned that 7 o'clock service. Well, I'm just going to blame you because I have the microphone, okay? We get to have a sunrise service. Now, down south, you do the sunrise services outside. Here is a different story. But look at the view, my friends. We can see the sunrise right in here and share in the resurrection miracle. And we'll be doing that on Friday. So we're going to have our time of prayer. And as we, as we pray, um, we want to remember, Trudy, your grandson is having surgery. Tell us his name again. Spencer Corwin. We're going to be praying for him this week. It's a pretty major surgery. And so let's pray for Spencer this week, remembering him. Is there anyone else that has a prayer request? Yes. Your mother. Okay. Let's remember Peter's mother. Mark, did you have a prayer request? Okay. It's a tough, uh, Mark is going through a tough time, and Peter is as well, when your parents are aged and you start losing them. Some of us have been there and know what that's all about. It's just hard. So let's remember them as well. Anyone else? Yes. Let's remember, David is going to be, Helga and Dieter's son is going to be having his kidney removed in a few weeks. Let's remember him in our prayers. He's been through a, a rough go of it, hasn't he? Let's remember him in our prayers. Let us pray together.
our Lord and our God, in the quietness of this moment, we just thank you for that still, small voice that speaks to our hearts. And on this day, it speaks of your great love for us. As we enter into Holy Week, we remember that your great love for us caused you to go through all that you went through, through your arrest, your beating, your rejection, the hatred that was spewed at you, and then the cross. And Lord, it would be so easy just to gloss over to Easter, but we want to remember what you have done for us because if we don't, Lord, we don't realize the magnitude of the price that you paid for our salvation. And so we simply say, thank you, thank you, thank you on this day that you loved us just that much. And so right now we put aside all the petty things in our lives, the things that are not that important, the things that distract us from really uh, communicating and loving and serving you. And we just say, Lord, we want to be fully invested in the kingdom. We want to be fully invested in the calling that you have on our lives. And Lord, I'm so thankful that you have a calling on our lives. That's amazing to me that you look at us as insignificant as we are, as fragile as we are, as fallible as we are. You look up at us and you love us. But we're your creation. And yes, there's 8 billion of us on this planet, but you love every one of us. And you have a calling on every one of our lives. And so Lord, regardless of our age or our station in life, we just want to say, Let us look at that calling. Let us examine our lives. Let us see what you're doing and what you need to do within us. And Lord, we say, have your own way in our lives, Lord. Do what you want to do. Move within us any way that you see fit. We just invite you to take over everything that we are. We surrender. We surrender all, as the hymn says. We surrender all. Now, Lord, we... We come to you with these prayer requests, these parents that are struggling with health issues. We remember Peter's mom, Mark's parents. We remember David as he is facing uh, surgery very soon. And we ask, oh God, that you will just bless him. And Lord, thank you for Trudy's grandson who is going to have the ability to lead a normal life because he's going to have surgery that will make the difference in his life. We just pray for all of these. We're thankful for them, God. We're asking that you will move in their lives and move within the hands of those that take care of them. Bless them, O oh God. Now, Lord, for our country, we realize that this is a traumatic time in our country's history. And, Lord, it just seems like there's division everywhere. It seems like there's hatred and anger. But we realize today that only through your great love, Only through your great restorative power, only through your peace that passes understanding can our nation come together. So we pray for that revival that started down at Asbury, that it will indeed spread throughout the the country and even the world. But Lord, we pray that one of the side effects of that is it will bring bring people closer together. Of course we want them to come to you. Of course we want them to know you as their Savior. But Lord, we pray for a renewal within our country. We pray for our leadership of our country, asking that they will have a revival within themselves, that they will come to know you as their Lord and Savior, that they will realize their need for you. They can't do these jobs on their own. They they don't have the wisdom. They don't have the ability. They don't have the strength. And so, God, I pray that they will have that moment of awakening, an awakening in their life that shows them that they desperately need you. So we pray for our country that revival will indeed happen. Now, God, we ask that you will just bless the remainder of this service. Give us ears to hear. May we hear what you have for us today. And, Lord, may we not only be just hearers, but may we be doers of your word. May we take your word and apply it to our lives. May we share your grace and your goodness with others. And, Lord, we ask that you'll teach us to pray, that you'll teach us to live in the same way you taught your earliest disciples. By praying together, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread 
and forgive us of our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen and amen. Well, today is the beginning of Holy Week, and we'll be reading in just a moment out of John chapter 12, and it's interesting that because already in John chapter 12, we are dealing with the final week of Jesus' life on earth before his crucifixion. That's chapter 12. How many of you know how many chapters are in John? Anybody know? 21. So there's 21 chapters in John, and almost half of those chapters are dedicated to the last days of Jesus' life here on earth. Isn't that amazing? And it's similar in the other Gospels. If you were to look at Matthew, you would find that 40% of Matthew is devoted to dealing with the last days of Jesus. 60%, 60% of of Mark, the Gospel of Mark is devoted to his last days, and one-third of the Gospel of Luke is devoted to the last days of Jesus on earth. And so for John, again, it's about half. And so we need to understand, and to me this tells the importance that the Gospel writers placed on what we call Holy Week, the week that we're entering into today. Did you know that in All four of the Gospels, if you add up all the chapters of the Gospels, all four Gospels, there's 89 chapters. And of those 89 chapters, only four of them, only four of them cover the first 30 years of Jesus' life. Have you ever thought about that? Isn't that amazing? 89 chapters and only four of them cover the first 30 years of Jesus' life, while 85 of those chapters cover the last three and a half years of Jesus' life. And of those 85 chapters that cover those last three and a half years, 29 of them are about the last week and then the resurrection. It's amazing. The gospel writers knew it was just that important. They put a lot of emphasis on it. And so today we begin Holy Week with an event that is mentioned in all four of the gospels. And we're going to begin in chapter 12 and verse 12 of John. And out of honor and obedience to the word of God, let's stand for the reading of the gospel again from John chapter 12, verse 12. Dean, if I can get you to turn this mic on. Thank you. And the next day, the large crowd that had come to the feast heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. And so they took branches of palm trees and they went out to meet him, crying, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the king of Israel. And Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, just as it is written. Fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. And his disciples did not understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been written about him and had been done to him. And the crowd that had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him to the dead continued to bear witness. The reason why the crowd went to meet him was that they had heard that he had done this sign. So the Pharisees said to one another, You see that you're gaining nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. And may God add a blessing to the reading and the hearing and the doing of his word. Amen. You may be seated. Just about six years ago, just about six years ago, I retired from the Air Force and I moved to to Michigan and Gene's life has never been the same. Right? She's trying to smile, by the way. But during that move, I happened upon my very first cell phone that I purchased 27 years ago. It was a Nokia. Did any of you have that Nokia phone? 
A bunch of you did. It was very popular. It, and, and, and as I looked at that phone, it was in some box. I wish I could find the charger. I'd love to see if it would still charge up. It's, it's still in some box. One of our boxes, Gene, probably in the barn. One of the many boxes in the barn. That are pro- Why do we still have those? I don't know. It's sentimental, I guess, right? <laughs> That's right. That's right. Preserving history, okay? But as I looked at that phone, I, I remember thinking, I don't remember this phone being so big. I mean, it's huge. And it has the little antenna that comes out. It was really a neat little phone. It did well. Um, and, you know, the only, what was the only thing it did? The only thing it did was call. And as I, as I was holding that phone, I took out my other phone. I, my iPhone, which is not this one, but one that was very similar. And I looked at it, and I put them side by side and realized that one was a dinosaur, and the other was kind of the latest and greatest. The one, the, the Nokia, only made calls. I don't think it even texted. Did it text? It didn't text. It didn't do anything except make calls. And yet, these phones right here are pretty amazing. Not only can you make phone calls, but you can send text, you can surf the web, you can GPS your destination if you're going somewhere. If you need a flashlight, it's there. If you need the weather forecast, you have it right here. It has a pedometer, it has a camera, it has music. You can do your banking online on this phone. It has television. It has email. I remember watching Star Trek thinking, oh, that would be so cool to have one of those little uh, communicators that you flipped open like that. You remember, you remember that? I can remember. And this is so much more. And, but most importantly, this phone is the greatest time waster in all of history. And you can walk around all day long with your nose to the phone, your eyes on the phone, and people have accidents. Every year you hear about people that walk into traffic, people that walk. I saw one recently where a woman walked into a water fountain because she had her eyes on the phone. It's an amazing device, but it can also lead to occasional frustration and stress. How many of you think your life is more stressful now because of this thing right here? A lot of us do. A lot of us do. Maybe you know what I'm talking about, and maybe you've experienced receiving an email or a text message that just sort of hits you the wrong way. Have you ever had an email or text message that just kind of pinged off you a little bit and just kind of hit you the wrong way? A while back, I received one of those texts from someone that I knew pretty well, and it got all over me. It really aggravated me. How dare he ruin my day? How dare he say something like that to me? I couldn't believe that this person would say something that was so hurtful to me. And I was angry and I was thinking about all the things that I was going to text back to him. I had it planned. I was just going to rip him up one side and down the other. And, And so after I calmed down, I eventually, I asked him about that text. And he looked at me very puzzled. And then he just kind of burst out in laughter. And he said, did you take that text seriously? I was just kidding. I was still angry, though. I was still aggravated. I read a while back that this is the reason why emojis were invented. And if my friend had just put one of those little laughing, smiley faces on that text, I... My day was ruined that day. If he had just done that, everything would have been okay. But he didn't, and I wasted a lot of time being very aggravated and upset. So context is everything, and had I known the context of the message, life would have been a little bit better during those days. One of the things that's most important to know when studying the Bible is context is incredibly important. We're doing 
a study in Romans for our men's group. And I, I love how sometimes one of the men will say, well, we have to remember what was going on in Paul's life at the time he wrote, wrote Romans. So context is very important. And you can take a passage of Scripture and you can study it. Uh, you can focus only on that small passage. But, but again, context is so important. And to really understand that passage of Scripture, you need to know what happened before and what happened after the verses that you're studying. Context is everything. And this is crucial to know as we are thinking and reading about John's gospel on this day, which is Palm Sunday. And you know, most of us are familiar with what would happen to Jesus following his entry into Jerusalem. He, we know that he would be betrayed. We know that he would be arrested. We know that he would go on trial. We know that he would be beaten. We know that he would receive a crown of thorns. We know that he'd be crucified. But that which happened before is also important. And in this situation, we know that Jesus had just raised his friend Lazarus from the dead. And I don't know if you have ever seen a person raised from the dead or not. Anybody? It's kind of a rarity, isn't it? I don't know that any of us have. But I have a feeling that if you saw that happen, it would be something that would get your attention. It would be something that you would not soon forget. In essence, the, an event like that would be somewhat of a defining moment in your life. And you know, we all have those milestone moments in our lives that we never forget. You, how many of you remember the time you met your sweetheart? Any of you? A couple of Now, men, you better be raising your hands, okay? Maybe you remember your wedding, and again, men, I hope you remember the date of that wedding, okay? How about when your children were born? How special was that? There are special moments in our lives. There's often moments that we just cherish and we remember and we're thankful for, but there's also some moments that bring sorrow. I was talking to a lady recently, and she was telling me uh, when she lost her husband in a terrible accident. Moments and days that cannot be forgotten, regardless of how hard we try, these are still milestone moments that will be forever in our mind. But there are also moments in our faith that are, are really important. The time that you gave your life to Jesus, I remember it well many years ago. I remember that night in Alabama, I made a profession of Jesus Christ as my Savior. Maybe you remember the time you were baptized. And what a special moment that was. And you know, for me, these are such good and sweet days here at New Hope. I know that I will never forget them. These are good days, and God is moving in a very special and wonderful way. Just the privilege of seeing Him move in our midst, whether it be in worship or whether it be in small groups, or just being together with our New Hope family friends, these are good days. In fact, these are great days. And so it's important to know the context of our reading this morning. And again, Jesus had raised his friend Lazarus from the dead. And as you can imagine, the people were in awe. So much so that they flocked to Jesus. Crowds bigger than what we have here today, much bigger than what we have here, were crowded all around Jesus. And they went to him uh, they went from calling him just a good teacher to calling him the king. Notice in verse 15, which is a direct quote from the Old Testament found in Zechariah 9, 9. It says, fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming on a donkey's colt. Now, did you know, I didn't know this until recently, that this is the first time that Jesus is referred to as a king in the New Testament. In this context, it also means Messiah, the long-awaited one. The people recognized him as the one that they had hoped for for generations. And now he was finally among them. They had waited for the Messiah to come for hundreds and hundreds of years. Now he would be their deliverance. And so this is what they were saying when they were yelling out, Hosanna. Now, if I asked most church members what Hosanna means... Most of us would be saying, well, it means to praise God. It means praise God, right? 
That's what I thought. I didn't know that it meant something totally different. But as I was preparing my message, I learned that Hosanna doesn't mean praise at all. In fact, it means save us now. Save us now. It doesn't mean praise you, Lord. It means save us now. And so the crowd, the people, were saying to Jesus, we know you're the Messiah. We know that you are God come down to earth. You proved this by raising Lazarus from the dead. We need a Messiah. We need someone to deliver us. We need someone to deliver us from this oppression that we're going through right now that we experience every day under the rule of this terrible Roman government. We need deliverance. Save us now. That's what Hosanna means. Say it together. Save us now. Maybe you've been in a similar situation when you have felt the need to cry out to God and say, I need help. I need a Messiah. I need someone to deliver me. And maybe like me, you've had a, a dark moment or two of the soul when you cried out to God for mercy and for help. And maybe those moments are still so deeply personal that they're even hard to talk about even on this day. And I can understand that. And so the majority of the people in this crowd surrounding Jesus, they were desperate. We've all been in those desperate situations before, haven't we? We've all been in those dark moments of the soul. They had undoubtedly been good religious Jews who were faithful to the required Jewish holy days or else they wouldn't have been there. They were there for the Passover celebration which was a time of remembering when God had led his people out of Egypt and into the promised land. And so if possible, it was required for a Jewish person to be in Jerusalem on the day of Passover. And so that's why they were all there. The streets were crowded. There was tens of thousands of people there. But you know, every year it was the same thing. Every year they took the same routes to get to Jerusalem. Every year they went through the same rituals. And every year they prayed the same prescribed prayers. And frankly, I, I believe for a whole lot of them, it had undoubtedly just gotten old. And I believe that they were hoping for something more than their religion was offering to them. They knew that there was some, had to be something more than just saying the same prayers and doing the same thing every year. And they found out that Jesus was in town. And they all went to him and they started, Hosanna. They started shouting, Hosanna. Save us now. Save us now. Deliver us now. Give us what our religion cannot give to us. And what they were saying and demonstrating was Jesus was a whole lot more desirable and a whole lot more appealing than their religion. And for them, Jesus, I believe they were seeing he was a breath of fresh air in a stagnant and stale religious atmosphere. You know, the common people had seen all the religious traditions. They had practiced all the rituals. But to them, Jesus was more appealing than dead religion and ritual. They saw something within Jesus that was special, something within Jesus that was fresh, something that w within Jesus that was life-changing. I heard a quote a while back from, uh, uh, that was attributed to General William Booth. Anyone know who William Booth was? William Booth was the founder of the Salvation Army many, many years ago. And here's what William Booth said. He said he kind of took after Gene on this. He said, I like my religion like I like my tea. I want it hot. I like my religion like I, I like my tea. I want it hot. And I think that if you were to ask most people today, they'd say the same thing. They said, if I'm going to have faith, if I'm going to believe in Jesus, I want it hot. I want it real. I want it authentic. I want it vibrant. I don't want the same old thing. I don't want the same old stale stuff that I've always seen. I don't want to go through the motions with ceremonies and ritual stuff, but I want my religion to be like my tea. I want it hot. Amen? Amen. 
I want my religion to be real. I want it to be authentic. I want my faith in Jesus Christ to have something, some substance. I don't want to just do the same old prayers. I don't want to do just the same old ritual. I want God moving in my life. And I think we can say the same thing for our church as well. And that's why most people, I believe, like the tax collectors and the prostitutes and the criminals found it easy to be with Jesus. They gravitated to Jesus because they knew he was real. They knew Jesus was real. You know, we often find that that Jesus shared time with these people. He didn't really like hanging out with the religious folks. He wanted to hang out with the authentic folks, the people that knew that they were nothing in the sight of God, the people that knew they had to have a Savior, that they needed a Savior, the people that were crying out, save me now. Save me now. That's why he hung out with the the murderers or the prostitutes, the tax collectors. Because he loved them. They were genuine. What was the appeal of Jesus? What was the big difference between Jesus and the, the common practice of religion then? Well, a couple of differences I want to share with you, and we'll close up. First of all, religion emphasizes the outward, while Jesus emphasized what was going on in the heart. Religion is all about how we look and what we do, but Jesus is all about who we are within our our souls and our hearts. Remember when he confronted the Pharisees, he asked them why they were always thinking evil things within their hearts. Or remember when he said that out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Jesus was always more concerned with what was going on in the inside of a person than how a person looked on the outside. And so religion is about outward appearances, but Jesus is about the inside of our hearts. Secondly, religion is is usually about what you can't do. Have you noticed that? Have you ever met someone that says, well, I'm, I'm a follower of Christ because I don't do this, that, and the other. I'm a good person because I don't do all these things. It kind of reminds me of that old saying, I don't smoke, drink, or chew, or go with girls that do. Any of you heard of that? I say whoop de doo What do you do? My friends, one of the amazing things about following Jesus, it it isn't about what we don't do, but it's all about what he has done. Amen? He can change us, and he will change us. It's about him doing a work in our lives. Thirdly, religion puts barriers up, but Jesus pulls barriers down. You know, if you, had, if you and I were in Jerusalem 2,000 years ago and we wanted to go to the temple to worship, there would be certain places that we could go and there'd be certain places we couldn't go. If you were a non-Jew, you couldn't get anywhere near the temple. In fact, you would have to stand in a place called the Court of the Gentiles. But if you were a Jewish woman, you could go a little bit further closer to the temple. If you were a Jewish male, you could get even closer. If you were a priest, you could go very close to the temple, but only the high priest could go into the Holy of Holies in the center of the temple, and he could only go there once a year. And so there were courts and there were walls that keep up, kept people out, and I've discovered that religion is really good about keeping people out. It makes people feel very devalued. It makes people not feel worthwhile sometimes. And so that's why it is our job to love people just the way they are. That doesn't mean that God can't change them, and that doesn't mean that God won't change them. In fact, the, the one thing about Jesus coming to our lives is when we have changed hearts, we will have changed lives. And yet, we as church members sometimes don't remember that. But Jesus said, come unto me all who labor and are heavy laden. Come unto me and I will give you rest. And Jesus was incredibly willing to include people and he still does today. Fourth and finally, religion tells us that you have to work your way to God. Whereas Jesus says, 
I am the way to God. Religion says you have to do all these things. And Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. My friends, most world religions are all about what you have to do to work your way to God. Things that you have to do and prayers that you have to say so that you can get close to God. But my friends, that is the religion of human achievement. It's not the religion of Jesus. It's not the gospel. Religion says that you must do, but God says, I've already done it for you. It's finished. All you have to do is receive what I've done for you as a free gift, and then I will transform you. Amen? And so the people gathered around Jesus, and they shouted, Hosanna, which in Hebrew means save us now. The people were crowding around him so much that the Pharisees said, See, the whole world has gone after him. This wasn't a small crowd. This was a huge movement because all of these people realized that they had an emptiness in their life. They had a need in their life. This week we will remember what Jesus has done for us. We'll remember him washing the feet of his disciples and having one last meal with them. We will remember his arrest. We will remember the brutal beating, the crown of thorns. We will remember the death upon the cross. We will remember. And that's exactly what Jesus told us to do. And Jesus knew his destiny even before his arrest He knew what was laying in front of him. And he told his disciples that whenever they gathered to eat, to do this, remembering him. And so today as we pause to remember and to be thankful, we also recognize that it isn't our works or our rituals or our religion that makes us right with God, but rather it's his grace that he shared as he took our place on the cross, as he shed his blood for the remission of our sins so that we could be made right with our creator and our heavenly father. And have life. And have real life. So today, I simply, as we are preparing to receive Holy Communion, I want you to know that you are invited. There's no barrier here. Nothing that will keep you away from experiencing God. You are welcome to this table. It's not a denominational table. It's not a New Hope table. It's the Lord's table. And you're welcome here. As we remember what he has done for us. I want to share with you some words of scripture. That on the night in which he gave himself up for us. He took the bread and he gave thanks and he broke the bread. And he gave it to his disciples. And he said take eat this is my body. Which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And when the supper was over, he took the cup and he gave thanks and he gave it to his disciples and he said, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. And so today as we enter into this sacred week, I just want to invite you to come forward and Pause to remember what Christ has done for us. And Dean, you can just turn off this mic. Pause to remember what Christ has done for us as we receive Holy Communion. And maybe within your heart today, you're shouting Hosanna yourself. Maybe you're sh- shouting, save me now. Deliver me now. I need your help. I'm desperate. And if that's you, then I want you to know that he will indeed help you. And he is there 
for you simply because he loves you that much. Amen? Amen. Let's pray together. Our Lord and our God, as we remember what you have done for us, we say thank you. Oh, Lord, let us not gloss over this week to get to next Sunday. But let us never forget the price that you paid so that we could have restoration with you. We could know you. We could have a relationship with you. And you gave your life for us, oh God. Not only did you give your life, but you suffered for us. And every drop of blood that was shed was to cover our sins and to bring us into a close and loving relationship with you. What a price you have paid, oh God. What love you must have for us. And we just say thank you. Change us, God. Draw us close to you. Bring us into that fellowship and that relationship with you. Show us love that we could have never imagined. And Lord, if there's anyone here that is crying out, save me now, deliver me now, I just pray that they will know your peace, that they will see you at work within their lives, that they will realize how much you love them. Thank you for that great love that's beyond our comprehension. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. As we come forward, we're, you're, you can just come forward in any order that you want. We're not going not to have ushers leading you to the altar, but just come forward and we will, we will serve you communion. And we would invite you, if you'd like to stop and pray right here up front, to make this, a, this place an altar of seeking God and experiencing Him anew and afresh. And as you're leaving... We ask that you go out the back side on the, on the side aisles and drop your cups in the little garbage can on each side. And so as our servers are, are ready, we will ask you and invite you to come and receive Holy Communion. Dean, is the keyboard channel on?
not seem very Palm Sunday-ish, but I feel that's appropriate as we just consecrate this week to knowing Him, not not religion. peace and may God's peace go with you as we travel through this week remembering what he's done for us in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and all God's people said amen. Amen. Amen.